Revelation chapter, first of all, chapter number one. I'm going to show you one verse in chapter number one, and then we're going to start in chapter number four. Tonight, what we are going to do is we are going to attempt to lay the groundwork so you understand what it, what the shift that is about to happen in the book of Revelation, okay? Um, if you have been around here for the last six weeks, we have taught you through chapters one, two, and three. We have not covered a lot of ground quickly, and that's by design because we want you to understand it. We digested bite by bite the churches uh, in Asia that John talks about uh, in chapters two and three. But in chapter number one, verse number 19, and I want to go back to this uh, each and every time we switch to a new section, because I want you to understand what Jesus told John to write and what those sections represent. Revelation chapter one, verse number 19, the Bible says, and this is Jesus talking to John on the Isle of Patmos, Write the things which thou hast seen. That's the first section. The things that you have seen. And that, of course, is everything in chapter 1. He's seeing it right there. It's Jesus showing up to him and, and, and uh, speaking to him, telling him to write a book called Revelation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says, write the things you've seen. That's part number one. <clears throat> the second part is this. He says, and the things which are. Those are the letters to the seven churches that we've spent the last month or so talking about seven letters to seven literal churches in Asia, but we said that those letters represent a time clock that is ticking down to the ushering in of the kingdom of God, okay? In other words, each of those letters is representative of a period of time in church history over the last 2,000 years, and if that kind of baffles you a little bit, you need to go back and watch and and maybe re-watch and re-watch the last, because can I say something to you? Is this is not this is deep stuff? Okay, this is not like you know, uh, it's not flannel graph world in Sunday school where you can put the little picture up and everybody got it right. I mean, this is deep. I mean, it, it, you got to use your head and put your thinking cap on, as they used to say. But that's the second section. So the things that you have seen, the things which are, and now we shift to the third section in in Revelation one nineteen, which says, and write the things and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Um, those, those of you who are new to church and new to Christianity, I want you to understand this. The, the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in the Old Testament, pretty much Hebrew. In the New Testament, pretty much Greek, right? So you have to go back to those native languages to see those original words that were used to kind of grasp the meaning sometimes when we translate it into a, a language like English. So I say that to say this. Revelation chapter number four, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Stay there for a second. That last word, hereafter. Write the things which shall be hereafter. That is a Greek word. It's a compound word, and it is meta, M-E-T-A, tauta, T-A-U-T-A. Meta tauta, meta tauta. It's a Greek word, and here's what it means. It means hereafter or after this. Uh, that's, what it, that's what it means, after this. So what he's saying is, I want you to write down, John, the things that you've seen, the things which are the churches and the things which shall be after this, okay? Now, after what? After the things which are. Does everybody see that? So, so the third section builds on the second section. It's after the things which are, which are the what? The churches, okay? Chapter 2 and 3. So the things that you've seen, chapter 1, the things that are, chapter 2 and 3, and Hereafter, metatauta are the things after these, after the churches. Because what we have taught you is, is that chapter 2 and 3 are representative of at least a 2,000-year span of time that started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit moved into the heart of the believer, and it's still going tonight. It is a span of time known as the church. Okay, You and I are in it. You are a member of Catalyst Church, but you are also a member of the body of Christ, and the church is the body of Christ. It is the hands and feet of Christ. You are a member of that. We are the church, the ecclesia, called out and assembled together. We are the called out ones, okay? So we are the church. Now, the church is going, it had a beginning date, and it's going to have an ending date, okay? The church wasn't around in the Old Testament, and it's not going to be around during the final end days. The church has an end date, okay? And that's what we're waiting on. We are waiting for the culmination 
of chapter number three and the beginning of chapter number four. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now go to chapter number four, verse number one, and I want you to see this, and I want to show you two words, the first two words of chapter four. So John is told, write the things you saw, write the things that are, and write the things metatauta that are going to happen after this, right? So it's only logical that in the book of Revelation, we should look for that phrase again, right? Meta tauta, to, to find out when it begins. Because when does the church end and the things that come after the church begin? The meta tauta. When does that begin? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Chapter 4, verse number 1, after this. Take a guess at what Greek words are after in this. Meta tauta. Okay. So when does meta tauta begin? It starts in chapter number four, verse number one. Meta tauta. After this. After what? Read the Bible with, with a little, with a, with a little understanding, right? You're reading along, okay? You're reading, you finish chapter three. It's the letter to the church of Laodicea. And then what does the Bible say? Very next words, chapter four, after this. After what? I mean, you just have to use your, your brain a little bit. After the church of Laodicea? No, no, no. The Laodicea represents that last period of time before the coming of Christ. Okay? So after this is after the church is wrapped up. Okay? Because there's coming an event, well, in, 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 in where the church will be taken out of the way. Now watch this. Chapter 4. After this is meta tauta. After what? It's after the church. Okay? By the way, if you watch the YouTube of this video, you can get my sermon notes linked down there on there. If you want these notes, you can have them. You just got to click that link underneath the YouTube video. It's not on Facebook, just on YouTube. After this, John writes, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Okay. So after this, meta tauta, after this, a door was opened in heaven. Now, I don't want to get spooky on you, okay? And I don't want to get out there in left field, but I want to tell you what that word door means because I looked it up today to make sure and and, and to to do it. You know what it means? It means literally, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means a portal. A portal or an entrance. That's That's what it said, okay? A door was opened in heaven, okay? John says, And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Okay? Now, this this has got language that just screams at us some things that we know from other scriptures, right? Okay? Come, uh, uh, well, a door being opened. The first voice I heard was as a trumpet. What did the trumpet say? Which said, come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be Meta tata. There's that word again, here, after. So God uses that word meta tata, that compound word in the Greek, twice there to say, hey, 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 we've just switched. Revelation 119 gives the outline, the things that you've seen, the things which are, and the things which are meta tata. Meta tata begins in chapter four, verse number one. Everybody got me? Okay. So what, what is the, the characteristics of the beginning of this next phase of the book of Revelation, meta tata. First of all, we know it comes after the church, okay? After this. After this. After what? After chapter 3. What's chapter 3? It's the church, okay? After this, these things begin. What do we see? We see a door being opened in heaven. That door is being opened to let somebody in, I believe. Who's that somebody? It's you. It's me. Okay? The door is opened, and the Bible says that I heard, as it were, of a trumpet, as it were, a trumpet talking to me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So you got a trumpet, and the the message coming from the trumpet is, come up hither. This language screams the event found in other New Testament passages. Okay? Okay? What is the event we're talking about? We're talking about the rapture of the church. A trumpet talking about uh, to me. Look, at, just let's develop this a little bit more. Look at verse number two, chapter four. And immediately, John says, I was in the spirit. 
okay? When you go to heaven at the rapture of the church, you and I are going to be in the spirit, okay? Bible says that our bodies are going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of eye when we meet Christ. Dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Elsewhere it says we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? So we see, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and sat on the throne. So John is sees a door open, a trumpet sound, a voice says, come up hither, and immediately he's in the Spirit and he's in heaven. Okay? What John is experiencing in chapter number 4, verse number 1 and 2, is the rapture of the church. It is that after this, the church is ended and the trumpet sounds, thus ending the second section and beginning the third and final section uh, of, 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 the, of Revelation, the, the part of the outline. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? So here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> I want you to look at, uh, you, you can write this down or turn there. I'm going to put it on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, the Bible describes the rapture of the church. And some people uh, push back against this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you later on in chapter number 4, I'm going to show you what's going on in heaven, and I'm going to show you that the church is in heaven. I'm going to show you that the church is in heaven and it's not on earth. I'm going to show you who's in heaven in this scene, in these 11 verses of chapter number 4 tonight, and I'm going to show you. But I want you to see Paul talking in 1 Thessalonians. He says this, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or the, the, the correct word is precede there, there uh, precede them which are asleep. Next verse. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the what? Trump of God. There's that trumpet sound again. This is, you know, people argue over, is this the second coming? Is this the rapture? Are those really the same thing? There's clearly two events described in the New Testament. Some people call it the secret rapture because the word's not used. Yes, the word rapture is not used in your Bible, but the catching away or the coming up, the harpazo, the Greek word, is used over and over, and it's actually all throughout the Bible. So the, the concept is there. God has done this a lot. He, he did this was with Enoch. He took him. He did it with Elijah. He took him up without dying, and he's going to do it with his church. So the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. You say, Brandon, what's the difference in this and the second coming? The second coming of Christ happens at the end of time, and Jesus comes back to settle the score. And he comes all the way to the earth. The thing about the rapture is he does not come all the way to the earth. He comes to the clouds and we are caught up to meet him in the air, the Bible says, okay? Jesus doesn't come all the way back to earth. He's coming to get his uh, uh, children. He's coming to get his church. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I like this part, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. From the time of the rapture on, the church is never out of the sight of Jesus. If he comes back at the second coming, we come with him riding on white horses, the Bible says, okay? We come with him, all right? We have a little uh, Lone Ranger mask and all that kind of stuff, all right? Uh, and then we say, hi, oh, silver. No, uh, uh, just seeing if you're awake, okay? So look at verse number 18. Uh, it says this about, about the rapture. And uh, did I put in 18? No, forget it. It just says, uh, wherefore, comfort one another with these words, I think. And I, it's fine, okay? I'm going to change anyway. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, okay? So this is a, a, an event describing the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians. Paul wrote that. Now I want to show you in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, a separate event or a separate passage that is talking about the same event. It says this, Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Okay, that's an apostasy is a Greek word. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So in other words, the day of the Lord, okay, or the final seven years, because the, the day of the Lord encompasses the whole seven-year period that we're going to talk about in a second. The day of the Lord cannot come until the, the, that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the thing that triggers is there's, there's a revealing, right? Okay, And <clears throat> what triggers the man of sin being revealed? Let's read on, verse number four. There's something that precedes the man of sin. See, people, 
people in prophecy today, they're trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. You're not going to know the Antichrist until something else happens first. But a lot of people trying to figure out who the Antichrist is uh, uh, don't believe in a rapture, okay? Or they believe in a mid-trib rapture or post-trib rapture, and it's just not, I mean, it just doesn't stand up the test of, of biblical scrutiny when you hone in on it. There is something that has to happen to trigger the man of sin, the Antichrist, as we call him, from even showing up on the scene, okay? So this Antichrist who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he has God's so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, okay? So he's going to proclaim to be God and actually profane the temple and sit in the temple. Remember ye not that when I was with you, yet with you, I told you these things. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, and know ye not, and, and, and now ye know that with, uh, what withholdeth, that he might re be revealed in his time. So Paul is telling in 2 Thessalonians, he's saying, look, the man of sin is coming, he is going to defile the temple of the living God. He's going to set himself up as God. And there's something withholding him right now that he, he he's not ready to be revealed yet. Something's holding him back, okay? And he goes on, verse number seven. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and that word letteth in, in the King James is the word hindereth, maybe in your scriptures, uh, maybe in some of the modern translations. Hinder. For the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or hindereth or holds back will let or will hinder. So that word hinder there instead of the word let. We're reading Old English here. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. If you break down that verse, what it is saying is, is that right now the Antichrist cannot be revealed because somebody's withholding him. Somebody's hindering him. Somebody's holding him back. Somebody's restraining him. All of these are the words the word letteth in the, in the old King James, okay? And that is, we know, the work of the Holy Spirit of God, okay? As bad, let me say this to you, as bad as this world is getting right now, you ain't seen nothing yet. You remove the Holy Spirit and you remove, okay? Every, you, you remove the preaching of the gospel, you remove the Holy Spirit from the lives of every believer and every believer from the face of the earth, there is no Jesus loves me coming from the churches. There is no, you see what I'm saying? You, you take all of that out of the way and it's gone in a split second. The restrainer is no longer restrained and literally all hell breaks loose on the earth. Okay. As bad as it is, it is being restrained right now. That ought to scare us to death, really. Okay. So, but one day he's going to be taken out of the way. And then it says this, verse number eight, and then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed. Who's that wicked? The Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. There's different names for him. Talk about the same dude, okay? He can only be revealed when the one holding him back is taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. God is the only one powerful enough to hold evil back in this world. I'm not, you're not, but where does the Holy Spirit reside? He resides in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, what? No, you're not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So what is, what is it talking about in 2 Thessalonians? It is talking about the restrainer being taken out of the way who happens to live in you and me. This is a reference to the rapture of the church. The church is going to be taken away. It goes back to 1 Thessalonians 4. It goes back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And John is seeing it play out in the Spirit. He is seeing a trumpet sound at the end of the church age and a door opened in heaven and a voice says, come up hither, and immediately he's in heaven. That's what you're seeing. I want to go to Daniel chapter number 9, verse 27, because when that wicked one is revealed, okay, the Antichrist, first, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, at the rapture of the church, the rapture has to happen before the Antichrist can be revealed, okay? The restrainer has to be taken out of the way, and then the, those <clears throat> times can be ushered in that we're about to look at in Revelation. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, the man of sin, the son of perdition, whatever name you want to use for him that is biblical is fine. In fact, probably the Antichrist is probably not the best one. Uh, that has just become, become commonplace to refer to that end times leader as the Antichrist. But he here... And he, talking about the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9, 
Okay, we're going to look at the previous verses here in just a few minutes. But he, okay, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, now, if you were in our Daniel series last year, you understand where I'm going with the weeks thing. A week is seven days. A week of years is seven years. A week is seven in the Bible. Okay, so what he is saying is, the Antichrist is going to confirm the covenant with many, or there's going to be a treaty, an agreement, a peace of some, some kind in the end times, and it's going to last for one week. It's going to last for seven years. How many have ever heard of the seven-year tribulation? Okay. Where that comes from is passages like this, where uh, it refers to seven years, or it refers to in the middle of the week, the 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 uh, covenant being broken, and it, and it tells us that the last half of this is 1,260 days. So if the last half is 1,260 days, the first half is 1,260 days. If you add them together and divide them by a 30-day month, you come to seven Jewish years, okay? I mean, this is, it's seven years, okay? So the Antichrist is going to make a covenant for seven years. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that the rapture of the church has to happen first. That triggers the opening up of the doorway for the Antichrist to be, even show up on the scene. Okay? I don't even know that the Antichrist knows that he's the Antichrist yet. Okay, Because the rapture happens, and it, it's a domino effect, and it, and, it tr and it ushers that in. But what I want you to see here is the number seven. Okay, Because the number seven, that one week, that seven-year period, is what we are about to look at in chapter four. It really starts in chapter five, but chapter four through chapter number 19 in the book of Revelation deals with that one seven-year period. The final seven years, by the way, before eternity begins and Jesus rules and reigns as king. Okay? So we're talking about the final seven years. So all of this preliminary stuff to get us to, to, to Revelation chapter 4. Okay? You say, Brandon, why is there final seven years? How do we know that? What do we, how do we know that? Okay? The book of Revelation and the book of Daniel mirror each other very closely. In fact, Daniel is, in my opinion, the revelation of the Old Testament, okay? And Daniel was showed a lot of the same things John was showed, the same things Ezekiel was showed, the same things Isaiah was showed, the same things Jeremiah was showed. All of these great writers of the Bible were showed a lot of the same things. And if you overlay those passages together, you're going to start to see, hey, that's the same thing Daniel saw. That's the same thing John saw. And you're going to begin to see it, okay? So Daniel is very important for us to understand. Outside of the, the messianic prophecies that prophesy that Jesus is going to come and die for the sin of the world and rise again in the Old Testament, my favorite prophecy outside of those messianic prophecies is Daniel chapter number 9. Okay? It is the most misunderstood, but it is the key to unlocking biblical prophecy. If you understand Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, you unlock prophecy for the rest of the Bible. You unlock Daniel, you unlock Revelation. Okay? But if you don't understand what I'm about to tell you, okay, then the rest of Revelation is not going to make sense to you. Okay? Daniel chapter number 9, verse 24. Now, and, and, and let me just reiterate. Pay attention right now because this is important. Okay? So many false teaching gets started because people don't understand who the final seven years is for and who it's not for. People say, well, there can't be a secret rapture of the church because... God never promised that he's going to save us from hell, but, you know, we're going to have tough days and, and, and we're going to have to face some persecution and things like that. We're not better than those that have gone on before that were martyred for their faith. No, we're not. But there's a promise to the church that he's not going to put us under his wrath in the seven final years are the wrath of God poured out on the earth. And then people will push back and they'll say, oh, that's not the wrath of God. It's the wrath of Satan. The wrath of God comes at the end. I'll show you scriptures all throughout uh, the book of Revelation. It's all Satan's doing it, but God's orchestrating. Okay? It's the wrath of God. Now, Revelation chapter number 9, verse 24, Daniel is given a prophecy. Okay? He's given a prophecy that is the prophecy of all prophecies. Outside of the Messianic prophecies, I mean, this is it. Okay? And here's what it says. It says, 70 weeks are determined or decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city. 70 weeks. Now, we said a minute ago, a week is how many? Seven, okay? 
So what, and, and, and people always argue over this because it confuses people when you say 70 weeks are determined on your people. Because we don't talk like that now. What, he, what we could translate that is, and we wouldn't be wrong, is say 77s. We wouldn't be wrong to say that. 77s, Daniel, are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city. 77s, okay? Now, 77s is talking about years, 70 times 7. How much is that? How much? 490, okay? And here's what he says. Now, don't miss this. 77s are determined upon thy people. Notice that. Thy people, okay? Okay? And what? Determine upon thy people and what? Thy holy city. What's the holy city? Rome? That's what they call it, right? It's not. It's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holy city. You know what the, you know what the future heavenly city is called? The new Jerusalem, God likes that name, okay? Jerusalem is the holy city. Who's thy people? Who's he writing to? Daniel here. Daniel's a what? A Jew, okay? So he's writing to the Jews, okay? So 77s are determined or decreed upon thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, what? Jerusalem, okay? And here's what he says. He says this. Here's what's going to happen during these 77s. Let's look at it. There's six things list, listed out here. He says this, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. So sin's going to end. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's a big one. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. All prophecy be fulfilled and anoint the most holy. So what's going to happen during these 77s, 490 years? Six things that basically tell us God's going to wrap up the earth in sin, pay for, judge iniquity, Jesus is going to be king, prophecy is going to be fulfilled. What is he saying? He's saying 490 years are determined upon Jerusalem, upon the Jews and upon Jerusalem, to what? To bring in the kingdom. The kingdom of God. The kingdom where Jesus sits on the throne. 490 years are decreed to accomplish all of this. Okay? Everybody see that? Okay? Now, uh, God loves you and God loves me, but I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. Okay? Uh, I'm not in Jerusalem. You're not in Jerusalem. See, a lot of people get awe. They, they think that, <clears throat> let me put my finger on this from a lot of, of, of bad teaching on this. There's this, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a teaching out there, and some denominations kind of prefer it and push it, that the church has replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology, okay? Catholic church pushes this a lot, okay? That the church has replaced Israel. In other words, Rome is it. The church is it. You know, they're the authority. And Israel, let me say something to you. God made a covenant with you, the New Testament. There's a New Testament in my blood, a new covenant in my blood, Jesus said. Okay? But God has never forgotten his chosen people and the covenant he made with them. Okay? He promised, he promised them things that would last forever. God does not. You and I may take our word for granted and lightly sometimes, God does not. When God puts his, his name on it and his stamp of, he's going to do it, okay? That's what he's going to do. So by the way, if he says he's going to save you, he's, you're saved. Ain't nothing you can do about it, okay? You couldn't get out of, it, out of it if you wanted to, okay? He said it. That's the truth, okay? You, you, you're so saved it's pitiful, one preacher said, right? So 77s in 490 years, all of those things are going to be accomplished. Okay? Now, here's where we're going. Don't, don't miss me. Some of you, this is the third or fourth time you've heard it, and maybe this time you'll get it, right? Okay? Here's what he says. Look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand. 
And he, he's telling us when the 77s are going to begin. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, or seven sevens, and three score and two weeks, or three score and two sevens. Okay? And I know I, I hate to bring math into a Bible study, but that's what it says. So he says, from the going of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So here's, here's the issue, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically Jer Jerusalem has been destroyed by the Babylonians. The people have been taken into captivity. Daniel is in Babylon writing the book of Daniel saying, look, 77s have been declared on thy people. 490 years are going to bring in the kingdom of God. Okay? And, and, and then, then God tells him, he says, here's how it's going to happen. Okay? From the, 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 the clock starts when the commandment from the leadership in Babylon, where you're at, in captivity, when the commandment comes to start rebuilding Jerusalem. Now notice what it says and what it doesn't say. It doesn't say rebuild the temple. It says rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, that's a very important distinction because they happened at different times and the math only works one way. Okay, to rebuild, restore and, re, uh, and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah, the Prince. So he's saying from the time that they let you go back and rebuild Jerusalem as captives, go back, he said, from that time, it is going to be to, uh, all the way to the Messiah, okay? It's going to be this. He says it's going to be, let me erase this. He says it's going to be seven, you guys see this? Seven weeks. Everybody see that? Okay? Seven sevens, okay? And then he says it's going to be three score and two, and a score is 20. So how many is that? 60 what? 62, Okay? Now, tell me what 7 times 7 is. Okay? Tell me what 62 times 7 is. Y'all there yet? Okay. All right. What's 434 plus 49? I'm going to help you. Huh? 483. It's been a while since y'all were in math class, hasn't it? So here's what he's saying. He said, look, from the time that they let you go back and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah is going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens. He breaks it down. You say, Brennan, why didn't he just say 69 sevens? <clears throat> because he broke it down into three periods of time. The first 49 years from the commandment on is when they went back and were actually rebuilding. A lot of theologians think, that's when, how long it took them to rebuild the city, okay? And then the rest of the time kicked in. But I don't want to focus on that right now. I want to say this. So from the time that, the, that they let them go back and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah is 483, which is 69 times 7. Everybody see that, okay? So let's not dig too much into God, why God divides it into 7 and 62 instead of just saying 69. The, the, the takeaway is that it's 69 sevens, which is 483 years. Okay? Now, how many, how many sevens were declared upon Jerusalem and the Jews? 70, right? So we're not quite there, right? But then you see something in Scripture that is phenomenal. Watch this. You see a pause button. Watch this right here. So... So from the command to rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, should be seven weeks and three score and two. That's 483 years or 69 sevens. The street should be built again and, wall, and the wall in, even in troublous times. Now watch this, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, now remember, he broke it down. He said there's seven first, then there's 62. And he says this, after the 62, shall Messiah be cut off. That word uh, cut off is executed. Okay, so here in the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh, they don't even believe this to this day. They believe that when the Messiah comes, he's going to set up shop and rule and reign. Here, Daniel tells them the Messiah is going to be executed. And they missed it. They still don't see it. It's right there. It's in Daniel. Daniel's not Paul. Daniel's not Peter. Daniel's not these outcast Christians, followers of Christ. Jesus people. Daniel's like old school, praying daily at the time of the evening sacrifice. 
of the royal line. He's one of the first ones taken into captivity because he's the cream of the crop, man. He was a, a, a Jew of the Jews, right? And here he is, and he says, your Messiah is going to be executed. When? Well, when they command to rebuild Jerusalem, fast forward 483 years, he dies. That's the prophecy given to Daniel. You know what happens if you do this? You go from 445 B.C., that's when the command was given not by the Babylonians, but by Artaxerxes Longimanus, who allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild the city. We know that it happened on March 14th. 444. We know the date. And if you do all the math, because I know we're going from Roman calendars to Jewish calendars and cross, if you break it out and you go 483 years, you come to the Messiah where it says you come to AD 32. Okay? AD 32. And you actually, there, there are folks who've broke it down to the day and, and, and broke it down to when Jesus wrote in the Sunday before the Passover, okay, on uh, what we would call Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode in on a donkey and was presented as the Messiah, that that was the fulfillment of when <clears throat> Daniel said, from the command to rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, is going to be 69 weeks. And after that, they're going to kill the Messiah. And, and then if you read that story, you know what happens? Jesus rides in on a donkey, they say, Hosanna, remember that? And then Jesus gets off of the donkey. And what does he do? He weeps. And he says, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, from now on, it's hidden from your eyes because you missed your day. You didn't recognize your Messiah. What is he saying? You didn't read Daniel. That's what he's saying. Literally, you didn't read Daniel. So, now, so, if you, historically, we come to there. Okay, well, this is A.D., you know, we can argue over the date, but A.D. 30 to 32, let's say. Okay, right in here. 483 years. Okay, that's the time of, of the Messiah. Then he's cut off. Let's read on. <clears throat> what happens then? Okay, so the Messiah will be cut off. <laughs> Notice what it says, but not for himself. He didn't do anything himself, but he was killed for somebody else. Does that sound familiar? I mean, this is coming out of the mouth of a Jewish writer. 600 years before it happened. Crazy. Okay? And the, now watch this, though. Watch what Daniel does here. This is amazing stuff. Then he says this. After they kill the Messiah, the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So don't miss this, because can I tell you something? You know what that just told you? That just told you where the Antichrist comes from. The Bible says after Messiah is killed, the people of the, here's the title, prince that shall come will, what, destroy the city and the sanctuary. That is a reference, because you're going to see it in the very next verse when this prince, he, makes a covenant for seven years. The he from verse 27 is the prince that shall come from verse 26. Does everybody understand that? Have I lost everybody? One of the names of the Antichrist is the prince that shall come. Watch this, though. It doesn't say he comes and destroys the, the sanctuary. It says the people of the prince that shall come. So he is representative of a people that destroy the city and the sanctuary, and later on in history, he's going to come from that same line of people. Does that make sense? Who destroyed the sanctuary after Jesus was, uh, was killed and resurrected from the dead? Who went in and destroyed? We just talked about this. Who, who destroyed the temple? The Romans. A.D. 70. They burned it to the ground. They destroyed it. And Daniel prophesied it. 600 years before it happened. Oh, I don't know if I believe the Bible. You got a hole in your head. You know what they do then? They say, well, I don't think Daniel was written 600 years before. 
And they'll start to try to early date Daniel. And the best they can come up with, <laughs> because it was translated. It was translated into Greek in the Septuagint 300 years before Christ. So their best argument is, I don't believe it was written 600 years before Christ. Only 300 years. The late date is 600. I think that's the accurate date. That's the time of Daniel. I believe he wrote it. The early date's 300. It's 2021 for a few more days. That would be like making a prophecy in 1721 and it coming true today if you use the early date. Or it would be like making a prophecy in what? 1520, no, 1420, I can't do math, 1421, 600 years before Christ, and it happened. So the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Then we see the verse we started with, verse 27, and he, who's he? The prince that what? The prince that shall come is going to make a covenant with many for what? For what? For one week. One times seven. Okay? We're waiting on seven years. Here's what I want you to understand. Daniel saw a prophecy that is going to last 77s. Okay? And it's for who? It's upon the Jews and what city? Okay? 483 years of it have already happened. How many more sevens are there? Just one. So how many more years are there in the prophecy? There's seven years that we're waiting on, which happens to be Revelation chapter 4 through verse number 19. So go in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4, verse number 19, and let's begin Daniel's 70th week. Okay. See how the Bible ties together? Revelation, Daniel. We're going to see a lot of things. Let's look here. Okay. By the way, let me just throw one, one thing at you. And if you're taking notes, Revelation chapter 4 through 19 are all about the 70th week of Daniel. That's what we call the end times. It's what we call the tribulation period. It's technically called the 70th week of Daniel. And I'm just looking over my notes, making sure that I give you all the information. Um, let, me, let me show you one verse here. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Thomas. Jeremiah 30, verse number 7. Um, there's a verse in Jeremiah that points out what's going to happen. And watch what, watch what Jeremiah calls this. He calls it the day of the Lord. He calls it, he says, Alas, for that, great day, for that day is great. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. Now, Jacob, how many remember Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the grandson of Abraham, okay? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name was changed. He is the namesake. His name was changed to what? Israel. His name was changed to Israel. So the, the, the final seven years are also referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. And if you change Jacob's name there, it's the time of Israel's trouble. Are you with me? And that's the same thing Daniel saw. 77s are declared not on every on your people, Daniel, and your holy city. Okay? Now, Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 1. I want to look at this. We've looked at uh, verse number 1 and 2. We have saw that John uh, met a tauta, saw a door open, a trumpet, talking with him. Come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Met a tauta again. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So here he sees one sitting on the throne. Let me say a, a word here. Okay? There's several men in the Bible who got to see the throne room of God. Okay? John is one of them. He's not the only one. Okay? Isaiah saw it. Ezekiel saw it. And I want you to see this. He, he is caught up to heaven. He's in the spirit. And he sees the throne of God. One that sat on the throne. Now watch this.
he sees, verse number three, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, so John is describing what he sees, and he sees the brightness of the glory of God, and he sees this, this, this beautiful, these beautiful lights and these beautiful colors, and he sees this rainbow behind, uh, uh, you know, uh, round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, if you study in Scripture people who have glimpsed into the throne room of God, <clears throat> um, you see some similarities. Ezekiel chapter number 1, verse 26 Ezekiel saw the same thing, and I want you to listen to this. This is Ezekiel from the Old Testament writing hundreds of years before John. The Bible says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Verse 27, And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. Look at verse 27 and, or 28. As the appearance of the bow, the rainbow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. So all around the throne room of God was the rainbow, okay? This was the appearance of the likeness. What, and, and, and Ezekiel tells us, he says, I'm going to tell you what I'm See, in John, he says, I saw a throne in one setting on the throne. Ezekiel tells us, well, when he saw that, he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's seeing God in his throne room. And when I saw it, Ezekiel said, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So back to Revelation, he, he sees this and it's, it's very similar to what Ezekiel saw. Then I want you to see this and I want you to pay close attention here. Don't, don't leave me. We, we've only got a few more minutes here, uh, but I want to make them count. Verse number four, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So he sees around the throne, he sees 24 other thrones. Okay. Seats. The word seats there is the word throne. These other thrones, other seats, okay? I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, these are the 24 elders, okay? 24 elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Who are these 24 elders? Who are these elders? They're clothed, okay? It says in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Well, first of all, I want you to look at, at uh, just, we'll just show it up on the screen, Revelation 19. We looked at this a couple weeks ago in the, in the letters to the seven churches, Revelation 19, verse 8. The Bible says this, and this is at the end of the, of the uh, tribulation when Jesus comes back, right before he comes back in this verse, and to her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. This is the bride of Christ, describing the bride of Christ. And it says that the bride of Christ is clothed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of who? Saints. So when the Bible talks about being clothed in fine linen, it is being clothed with the righteousness that God gives us and being clothed rightly in his eyes. And if you go back to chapter number four, verse number four the Bible says that there's 24 seats, and on those seats sat 24 elders, and all of them have white raiment on, okay? That's the first clue that tells us this. These are not angels. These are not heavenly beings. They're not cherubim. They're not seraphim. They're not, they're not what are they? Which are humans. They're people, okay? They're clothed in white raiment. What's another evidence? Watch what it says at the end of verse 4. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Remember this from the, to the, from the churches? <clears throat> he told uh, the church, I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head, one of the early ones. He said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison 
that he may that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a what? Crown. How does God reward those who are faithful in their service to him? He gives them a crown. Okay? So here, back to chapter 4, verse 4, we see these 24 elders, and they're clothed in white, and they have crowns on their heads. Guess what this tells us? It tells us these are not angels. They are human beings. They are redeemed, saved people. They are the saints of God, and they are in where? Where are we at? Where are we looking? In God's throne room, right? In heaven, inside the throne room of God. 24 elders. Now, people wonder, who in the world are these 24 elders? Well, the next chapter tells us, and I just want to take a sneak peek over there. Chapter number 5, verse 8. And you don't have to turn to all these. You can look at the screen. Just jot down the reference. And you can get those notes later and, and check it out a little deeper. Verse number eight, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts, let's talk about when Jesus takes the book, and we'll talk about it next week. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, Jesus, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, us to God. Who's talking? The elders are talking. And they're singing a song to Jesus because next week you're going to find out that he reaches out and from the Father he takes the book that is sealed and nobody's worthy to open the book. And that, that book is the title deed to the earth. And he's the only one who has the right to take it. And he takes it and begins to open the seals. And as he begins to open it, things begin to happen on earth that play out over seven years. So here's what I want you to see. But these elders, when that happens, they fall down, they, they sing in a song to Jesus, and they say, you have redeemed us. Who is it? Humans. Can I tell you who it is? It's the church. It's the church. It's the church. Can I tell you this? Isaiah saw the throne room of God in the Old Testament. Go look at it. Isaiah chapter 6. Ezekiel looked at it in Isaiah chapter, or Ezekiel chapter 1. None of them. They mentioned the angels. You're about to see they mentioned the beast. But you know what they never mentioned? The elders. You know why? Because when Ezekiel saw it and Isaiah saw it, they weren't there. You think if there's one throne and then there's 24 other thrones around it, you would pick up on that, right? It's kind of a forefront thing. But it's not mentioned in the Old Testament because it hadn't happened yet, but something has happened. The church has ended, and now we're in Meta Tauda, and the church has come up hither with John, right? And we're seeing the church in heaven, and I'm about to show you a little bit more of that. And prove that to you a little bit more. The church is all in heaven, and they're represented. Now, you say, Brandon, wh wh why 24 elders? Those 24 elders, I believe they're humans. They're the redeemed. Revelation 5 tells us that. But, listen to me, I think they are representative, somehow, of all of the saved. Okay? I don't know how that breaks down. People have tried to wrap their heads around why 24 and I don't want to take you to too much, but remember Jesus' disciples were kind of like arguing over who was going to rule over what, right? When they were walking with him. And Jesus said, in the end, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones in the kingdom. And you're going to judge Israel. So the 12 apostles are going to sit over, the, over Israel. So does that 12, does half of it represent Israel and half of it represent? I don't know. But there's 24 elders, and here's what we know. They are human beings. They've been saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and they have crowns on their head, which means that they were faithful on earth to the Lord. Okay? That's, that's all we know as we're studying through here tonight. Now look at verse number 5. And out of the thrones proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Okay? This is symbolic. Every time you see God show up, in, I mean, like God's like right there in Scripture, uh, my mind goes to Mount Sinai. You remember when like Moses goes up and God comes down and the people stand back and they're like, <gasps> right? 
You know what they heard? Look at Exodus 20. Here's what the people, as they were looking at the mountain, saw as Moses went up to meet God. And all the people saw the what? Thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the what? Trumpet. And the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off, I guess. Right? So they pulled back. Well, in Revelation, we see lightnings, we see thunderings and voices. And there were, now watch this, there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. What are those seven lamps of fire? Which are the what? Seven spirits of God. Now, we've already covered some of this ground before. Seven represents completeness, 100%. Say, Brennan, why do you believe that those elders are humans? Well, first of all, they're clothed in white linen. They have crowns on their head. And they say that they've been redeemed in chapter number five. But here's further evidence. You see the seven spirits of God. Are there seven spirits of God? What that seven means is 100% of the spirit of God is in that throne room at that time that John saw it. You say, okay, big deal. The Holy Spirit of God is collectively 100% in the throne room of God at that time. See, when I go home tonight, the Holy Spirit goes with me. The Holy Spirit goes with you. The Holy Spirit's at your house, and 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 your house. He don't stay here. He goes with you. So tonight, all over this globe, in every little pocket, nook, and cranny of the globe, the Holy Spirit is there and there and there and there, right? Doing his work. When John sees him in heaven, the Holy Spirit has been taken off the earth, and 100%, he's in the throne room of God, 100%. You see what I'm saying? That's the first time in a long time that that's happened. That tells you something. The restrainer is in heaven now. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The restrainer has been removed to heaven, and you're there too, represented by the elders, and we're clothed in white, and we're singing a song to the Lamb because he's redeemed us. That's what John saw. He saw that first. Why? Because it begins with this, the the calling up of of, of the church. Now, watch this right here. And uh, I got two minutes. I can do this. And before the throne... There was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. That sounds scary. Four beasts. Some of your Bibles may say living creatures. Okay, four living creatures. Four beasts full of eyes or four living creatures. And verse number seven, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a uh, man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So it tells us what these living creatures, they have six wings. What are they? Well, it turns out that somebody else in the Bible has been here too. Okay? And I want to I show you that, and we're going to be done. Ezekiel chapter number 1, verse number 10. When Ezekiel saw the throne room of heaven, here's what he saw. And he saw, as for the likeness of their faces, he saw four living creatures around the throne. And he says, here's what he saw. They four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four had the face of an eagle. So the same four things are mentioned. The the word calf is in in Revelation and the word ox is in Ezekiel. But that is, it's a cow. You see what I'm saying? There's similarities between what, very close similarities to what Ezekiel saw And what they saw. Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw, here's what he saw. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now watch what he saw. Above it stood the seraphims. Notice that word. Each one had six wings. With twain, or two, he covered his face, he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And what did they say? Here's what they said. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full 
of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And, of course, Isaiah falls on his face and says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. What are these living creatures? I believe that they are seraphim, created beings that God created that Isaiah saw, and they're still there, and they're singing holy, holy, holy to the Lord in the presence of the church that has just arrived, the Holy Spirit that is 100% gathered in the throne room of God, and this is a gathering. Can I tell you what this is? This is a church service that you're seeing in chapter number four where Jesus is there, the Father's there, the Holy Spirit's there, all of us are there, and we are about to see a book be taken and handed to the only one who has the right to open it, Jesus Christ, who is the heir of all things, and he is about to open that book And he's about to unleash the wrath of God on sin. And he is about to come after Israel to drive them back to him. And as we talked last week, on the countdown clock, we're there. And I'm just going to read this. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, and I believe all of us, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Next week, we're going to look into that day when Jesus takes the book, okay? He's going to take the book and he's going to begin See, the book of Revelation is about popping into heaven for a little while, seeing what's going on up there, and popping down to the earth and seeing what's taking place down here as the book is opened up there. Because what heaven does impacts down here. And so what we're going to do is see it played out, and John pops back and forth and gives us the scenes on both sides. And we're going to walk you through, and we're going to walk you through What is going to happen during that final seven-year period that this earth is in existence? You say, when is that going to start? It it is going to start. The first thing is the rapture of the church. That could come at any moment. It's the next thing on the prophetic calendar. We are in the Laodicean church age, and we're waiting for the clock to strike midnight, and the Lord could come back at any time. It is closer than it has ever been, and when that happens, that paves the way for this to be ushered in this final seven-year period. Hope you learned something tonight. Father, go with us. Help us. We love you so very much, Lord. And we pray that you would anoint us. Help us to learn this stuff, but not just learn it for for the sake of knowledge, because knowledge puffs up. and We don't want to be puffed up with pride. We want God to be humble. We want to realize that time is short, and we want to get uh, out there into the world and lead people to Christ and be what we're supposed to be. Let us have a a holy fire on the inside of us, Lord, that guides us and motivates us and and leads us to to share the gospel with people and love people and reach people before it's eternally too late because this book is real. These things are going to happen, and we need to understand it and know it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.